Good morning. We just want to say welcome and thank you for tuning into our service today. This morning we have a, a great message. Uh, I'm going to bring this message or this sermon a little different today. Uh, it just kind of reminds me of when I was young. And, and, and anyways, so back in the day when, when the Jewish people shared the Word of God, they, they didn't preach it. You know, it was not like this verse by verse expository teaching. It was more on the basis of a story or an account. And, and so reminds me of when I was young, actually, you know, I remember sitting around a fire just at a barbecue and, and just sitting around with my grandpa and my uncles, my dad, my older siblings, cousins, whatever. And I remember them telling stories and accounts of their life and things that they had gone through. Sometimes it was things that were pleasant, but a lot of times it was just challenges that they faced in life. And I just remember them talking about these things and how they overcame and things like that. And so this message in the book of Acts 27 verses 1 through 44, I want to share this account in the word of God, not by verse by verse, but more on that story type of approach. And so I've entitled this message, message The Divine Voyage of Paul. And so before we jump into all of it and start going through these sections, I wanted to share with you a little bit of foundational work so that we can build the rest of this story on. Uh, but before I do that, I must say this, church, that when we read the Word of God, when we talk about the, the accounts in His wonderful and an infallible Word, we have to realize something. The Word of God, the central character is Jesus Christ. And a lot of times we make the mistake of thinking that the central character of the Bible is us. But in reality, it's all about Him. All things in the Old Testament point to fulfillment in the New Testament of Jesus. And, 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 and so just wanted to share that before we jump into this. So let's get right in. So in, in this, just the foundation that I want to lay today, we have to remember that at that time, Paul was, uh, he, he's, he's a Jew, but he's a Roman citizen by birth. And uh, Paul had been ordained, as I said earlier, as the apostle that would bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But back then, you know, there was all these different authorities of the world. You had the Pharisees, their authority, their, their kind of like their, their ranking system of who was over who, who was this person. Same thing in the Roman uh, civilization. They had governors, they had nobles, they had all these things. They had centurions, they had all these things. But then finally they had Caesar. And so in the midst of this entire account, Paul is on trial because he was sharing the word of God. So the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin used this to their advantage, so to speak. And so, you know, they, they, they were trying to trap Paul because they said that he was breaking their law. But in reality, the reason they were mad was because what Paul was teaching was challenging everything that they had uh, uh, gone through or that through, that they had lived. But what they wouldn't realize, what they were not realizing, is that the Messiah that they were looking for had already came in, in Jesus Christ. That was the Messiah, and 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 that 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 warrior king that they were looking for was Jesus and yet they missed it and actually they were part of of the ones that crucified our Savior Jesus Christ and so in this they're trying to trap Paul they're trying to put him to death and so in this story we see that Paul continues to appeal every time he goes to this governor to this next person he finally appeals to Caesar but the thing is church we had to realize when Paul uh, appeals to Caesar, it was not by his own power or his own strength. It was actually by the guidance of the divine hand of God. And, and so I'm going to share a little bit more on that. But I wanted to share that, that ain't that how the world operates. The worldly authority feels like they have power and authority over everything. And at that time, they, they had that same mentality. They thought that they had the power of life and death over Paul. No, the thing is that the only one that has that power is God Almighty. And so it kind of reminds me even of our Savior Jesus. If you remember, Jesus was, was arrested. He was taken before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate really thought, hey, I have the power to either 
condemn Jesus or release him. And so they had that custom that they would let a prisoner go. And of course, we know the story. Jesus is not released and he was actually crucified for us. And so it's not that Pontius Pilate had power. No, it was the father's plan that Jesus would die on the cross to pay a penalty, not of his own, but so that he could pay for our penalty, for he, that he could take our stead, that he could trade places with us. It's why Jesus went to the cross. And that, that plan was to save us from ourselves. And what made him do it? What made him do it is that love drove him to do it. Love made him die on the cross. Why? Because he loved us. Wow, what an amazing thing. So we look at the story of Jesus. We look at the story of Paul. And something that comes to my mind and into my heart, I begin thinking and asking the question of Jesus Christ and Paul, if they were in the will of God, then why was it that they were constantly facing challenges in their life? Well, the answer is simple, church. At times, God allows moments in our lives that are going to challenge us challenges. And why does he do that? Because a lot of times in those challenges, we suffer, we suffer under tribulation, pain, sorrow. But the thing is, it's not, it's not because we're uh, using it to punish us, but it's actually tools in the hands of our sovereign God to grow us, to sanctify us, and, and so a lot of times we feel, man, what did I do wrong? Why has God punished me? No, the fact is that God is allowing this to grow you and to build you. And that many times through these moments, it stretches our faith. It tests our faith. And then it also makes us rely not on our own strength, but the strength that God provides. Amen. So what a powerful, powerful thing. But in our minds and our hearts, that's contrary to everything that we believe love is, right? And so with that said, let's keep moving here. But church, I've realized this, that there is something really powerful when we have victory through adversity. And let me explain this a little more. There's something amazing, church, about winning a game by 70 points. Yeah, it's great and all, but there's something really, really, really awesome about when you win, like in the last seconds on a football game with a Hail Mary, or, or like when you're playing basketball, you're down by two, and, and they, they, they toss the ball in, and you shoot, and you hit a three-pointer at the buzzer. Or, or like when you're in baseball, you're behind a little bit. It's your turn to bat and you hit a grand slam and you hit a walk of home run and you win the game. Man, there's something so powerful when you win and when your victory comes where there's opposition. And so with that said, we're going to see kind of these things play out as we get into the rest of this story. So in the book of Acts 27, verses 1 through 11, uh, we're going to talk about Paul's voyage towards Rome and what transpires on this voyage. And so God had already predetermined that Paul was going to take the gospel to, the, to Rome and that the gospel of Jesus Christ was about to shake the foundations of Rome through his gospel. But this trip, this voyage to, uh, to, to Rome, all these officials were but pawns in the great scheme of God's plan. So God had predetermined the work of the gospel to go to Rome. And so he sent Paul. And as I said earlier, after all, Paul was the apostle that had been ordained to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so Paul and, and, and all those people on this ship, uh, as a matter of fact, Paul had befriended some of them, were about to discover that all their trust in things of the world would be lost at sea. And so I just want you to just use your mind and your imagination and your heart and to kind of just put yourself on this ship with Paul and the rest of the crew. So imagine, imagine yourself in, in, in this vast ocean, and we can even call that vast ocean this life, you know? So they're on, the, they're, they're on this ship, they're in their ocean, and, and they, they were gonna have some choices to make in the midst of this voyage. And so uh, one of the greatest things that they were gonna learn was that they were gonna learn, whether they wanted to or not, that they were gonna have to trust God in this voyage, uh, not 
they would perish. And so we see this, that in even with their all their experience, with all their savvy, all those things compared to the vastness and the power of the ocean and these storms were meaningless. They had no influence whatsoever on the weather that they were encountering. And so as they encounter these treacherous seas, they begin to see that all their tools, all their knowledge, uh, their manpower and even the lifeboats that they drug behind the that the, the ship were meaningless in, in the vastness of the sea you know and, and how powerful it is and sometimes church let's be real sometimes God allows us to see that uh, uh, through hurricanes right God is so powerful he has this border he has this this place to where uh the oceans only come so far, so far, you know, but there's times that God just allows that ocean to come a little bit further on land just to show us how small we are compared to the vastness of the ocean. Amen. And so we see that that, that all these things that they were going through and th from the very onset of this journey, the theme became difficult, you know, and, and, and the the, the theme was difficulty, was trials, was tribulations, was suffering, was hunger. All these things became the common theme throughout this entire journey. And it's crazy because as you see in, this, in the portion of the Word of God, it seemed that even the winds were blowing against them, not wanting them to continue forward in the journey, but actually felt like the winds were actually trying to push them back. And that's, is that not how life is at times? Sometimes it seems that you take one step forward and then the challenges of life hit you, uh, that wave of challenges hits you and, and pushes you two, three steps back. And, and I can relate to that. But they were going to see that even against these contrary winds, these winds that were trying to drive them backwards, that only the anchor of God could keep them grounded, keep them afloat, and keep them from capsizing. And capsizing is basically just flipping the whole boat over, right? It was only the anchor of God that could keep them from certain destruction and death. And so scripture tells us, church, that... That Jesus Christ, wow, this is awesome right here. And if you know anything about sailing, this would bless your heart or boating. So scripture says that Jesus is the anchor of our soul. And he is the only one that can keep us safe from the turbulent waters of life. As we've seen the physical act with Paul and the people that were with him. But we can also apply this to the spiritual aspect of our lives. And so Paul and his companions in the midst of this whole storm, they finally get to this land and, and to this place called Fairhaven. And we're going to see, we see in the word of God, if you get a chance, read the book of Acts 27. But they reach this place called Fairhaven. And, and to me, it's really neat because to me, Fairhaven almost gives this false hope of safety. But in reality, it didn't mean safe haven because our only safety is found in Jesus Christ. Is that not true? And we see this in the world we live in. And so <clears throat> we, we see a lot of times these things, we see this false hope, these false securities that we put all our trace, trust and faith in. Uh, for example, like our jobs, sometimes our possessions, sometimes our positions, sometimes our home, our families. You know, we, we have this tendency, church, to, to put everything we own and, and try to bank on the things of the world when we should be banking on Jesus. Amen. So when we see this, we, we, we we're given this false sense of safety, but our only true safety comes through Jesus Christ. And so even after Paul, you know, the man of God was with them and Paul had been counseled by God, had, 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 had seen this angel of God come and, and told them, hey, you know, do these certain things. But they didn't give heed to Paul because they were stubborn and they had desires of pleasure and all these things that drove them back into turbulent waters. And that, I don't know, church, but I can really relate to this message because many times I do that. Instead of 
staying or waiting like God tells me. I want to take matters into my own hands and I want to rush back into the things that God has saved me. And so we see that at this very portion through scripture that they rush back into the turbulent waters and they begin to see uh, that they had uh, and they began to see and they also discovered the emptiness of their hopes and the folly of their conduct. And the second part of this is uh, Acts 27, 12 through 20. And I kind of entitled this part, the anchor, uh, way the anchor. And so when the crew, after they were at Fairhaven, they had kind of seen the storm and, and the oceans begin to calm. And, and so they seen that the ocean had become calm, that the weather was fair. They arose and said, hey, weigh the anchor and let's prepare to sail. And so there's dangers in that church. I don't know if you've ever seen hurricanes, but there's this danger that comes. So it's all these storms and in the middle of a hurricane, it's called the eye of the hurricane, which we would refer to as the calm before the storm. And so there was this calmness, but then we see that after, as scripture says, when they say peace, then sudden destruction follows. And that's exactly what was happening at this point in these verses that they seen it was calm, they seen it was fair, but they were, they were, they had no clue that the, the strongest part of the storm was yet to come. And that kind of happens in our lives. And so they're, they're hit with this storm that is called the Northeastern. And so when they were in the midst of their storm, you know, uh, uh, they're, they're being tossed to and fro. But see, they had done something ready that, that was very careless. They had ready anchor, uh, weighed anchor. That means they had ready raised the anchors off the bottom. The thing, that very thing that was keeping them stable, the thing that was keeping them from being tossed to and fro, the very thing that was keeping them uh, grounded on that foundation they had already picked up. In church, I see that many times we do that in our lives. Jesus comes, he calms the storms of life all around us. And because we see this calmness of the waters, we take for granted and we say, hey, I'm going to move on. I'm going to sell on. And, and, and before we know it, we're, we're back in the middle of another storm. But the thing is, we've already made that mistake of telling Jesus to weigh anchor. And man, that is a scary place to be, church. If Jesus is not the anchor of your soul and the storms of life, man, we, we run the trouble of being tossed to sun destruction, to our death, and, and, and to many other things. And so uh, this is a great lesson for us. And I love what uh, Matthew Henry, I believe, is the one that said this. He says, let us not think that we are saved till we enter heaven. And I think there's a lot of value in that. You know, we think, hey, we're saved now, the storm's calm. But yet, like just the eye of the storm, the greatest part, the worst part of the storm is yet to come. So in that time, church, it says in Scripture that they neither saw the sun nor the stars for days. And there's something really powerful because at this time they didn't have GPS. They didn't have these navigational systems that would direct them to where they needed to be. They relied on the stars. They relied on the sun to get them to their destination. But at that, can you imagine that? They were in total darkness with no sense of direction. And they were just going along in the vastness of the ocean. It's kind of like us, church. There was a moment in our lives that we were going through life with no sense of direction until Jesus Christ came into our lives and he led us, not astray, but he led us to the destination through himself. Amen. And so that is a powerful and awesome picture. And so at that time, church, they see no end to the storm. They see no end to the direction. They had no sense of direction. And, and it was only Jesus that could get them through these things. And so we, we were there once, church. We were living that life of depravity and we were trusting in the things of the world to get us through, like jobs, through like money, all those things that I gave you in a list of earlier. But the word of God says that all the thing that the world has to offer is vanity. Wow. But 
praise God, but God, you know, thank God for that expression, but God shone his light. And, and that's what happened to us, church. When we were in the middle of darkness, Jesus, who is the light, revealed a path for you and me. And Psalm 119, 105 says that he, that, that, that Jesus, right? He's the light. So he, it says in one, Psalm 119, 105 says, for your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Wow, church, all our lives before Jesus, we we're in darkness, but he, the light, is directing us and showing us the way we should go. And so the thing is, church, uh, at this moment, uh, the crew is, is has to make a decision. They were either going to have to allow their worldly goods to be tossed over so that they could be saved or they were going to perish with those things. And so what, what scripture says is that they begin to jettison the cargo. They begin to get rid of all these things that they had false hopes and false security in, like, like their, the food, the grain, uh, uh, you know, their, their, all these things they were throwing over ship, uh, over the side of the ship or not, they were going to perish with them. And this is the offer that Jesus makes us today, church. We, we need to choose today who you will serve. Will you choose to unload the cargo of your sin and let Jesus lighten the vessel of your soul? And that's what he did, right? That's what he did on the cross. He took our sins upon himself so that you and I could be freed from that burden and that weight of sin. And so Jesus offers that same thing today as, as he was telling them, lighten the load of the vessel so that you will not perish. And so that's the same thing that is being offered. If, if you will take your sins and give them to Jesus and let him lighten your, the burden of your soul and of that sin. And what a beautiful and awesome offer that Jesus gives us today. And so they had to abandon self, church. They had to rely on God and not on their things or themselves. And so I encourage you, church, uh, uh, that our hope uh, or, or I encourage you to cling on to the hope of Jesus Christ. For after all, he is the anchor of our soul. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> the next portion uh, of this, this, this sermon is, is found in Acts 27 verses 21 through 29. And I entitled this, Give Heed to Warnings. And church, if we go back and we rewind just a little bit, if you remember... Uh, Paul had stood up and, and had told them, hey, guys, this is not a good idea. We should stay here the winter. But they didn't give heed to the man of God. And church, there is dangers when we do not give heed to the warnings that God gives us through his son, Jesus, through himself, through the Holy Spirit. And at times he uses other people to warn us uh, 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 of dangers. But there's 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 something that we do, church, you know, uh, they warn us, it comes, it goes in this ear and it comes out the other. And so I just want to encourage you when you hear warnings from, from other people, and of course, pray and discern these things. Hey, are these things from God or not? But the main thing is that the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit will never lead you astray. And he's always warning us and he's always sharing with us, hey, don't do that. Don't go that way. But a lot of times in disobedience we do. And for that reason, there's consequences. And so Jesus, God Almighty, has given us the greatest warning of all. And, and that greatest warning comes in the, from a, a verse in Matthew 4, 17. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And as, as I said, there is great dangers when we do not hearken the warnings of, of God. And so the crew of the ship uh, faced certain death if it were not for the faithfulness of God to Paul. Man, and that's a, an important uh, piece that we have to look at here is that because there was favor over Paul's life, the rest of them reap the rewards of them not perishing. And, and so, so there's something really powerful here. But their failure and our failure is that we bring ourselves many times into grave dangers and troubles for this very fact, church. We can't gauge for ourselves when we are far off. 
That's why I praise God that he sent God the Holy Spirit to help us, to warn us, to help us avert from bringing in self-inflicted harm and loss. And I praise God for that. He has given us the Holy Spirit to give us warnings. Hey, don't do that. Uh, stay away from there. Don't, don't go there today. You know, thank God for that, that he has given us this warning device that comes to God, the Holy Spirit. But the thing is, in this message, we see that 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 they would not hearken the voice of the man of God, and so what happened is that at that very point, they 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 had hit the strongest point or the strongest part of the storm, and they felt themselves in total despair. So much church that they they didn't even eat for days. They were so afraid that they were about to lose their lives and that that ship was going to be destroyed, that even their appetite had left them. But then something amazing happens. God speaks to Paul, and when he does, Paul stands with confidence and encourages them to take heart. Can you imagine that? In the midst of this storm, Paul stands up and says, Hey, don't lose heart. Take heart. God is not going to let us perish. He's already given me his word and he's not going to let us perish. And so that same offer is, is here for us today. Jesus said in his word that if we accept his son, Jesus, we will not perish, but we will have eternal life. And we'll get to that a little more here in a minute. So Paul tells them there will be no loss today. There will be no loss of life today. Paul, Paul's confident profession, his confidence came because he was able to declare it because he had a relationship with the living God, the one that brings them, that, that can and will resurrect life, the one that brings things back to life, the one that brings hope, that gives hope, where there is none. And, and that hope, church, the only hope we can find that in is in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the awesome thing is Paul knew with all confidence, with all assurance that no storm, no tempest could hinder the work of God or the favor over his people. And so what powerful assurance, what powerful confidence you and I can have if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so scripture says that Jesus simply, if you remember, there's this storm when Jesus is in the boat, there's this storm. And, and some versions say that Jesus simply shushed the storm. He is the only one, church, that can calm the raging storms of our life. He's the only one that can comfort comfort us. He's the only one that can direct us with his life. Uh, he's the only one that can direct us with his light. He is the only one that can get us through these storms. And he's the only one that will help us persevere through these challenges, through these adversities, through this opposition. Only Jesus is the only one that can get us through these things. And so we see that on this voyage, the man with Paul uh, should consider themselves lucky. No, you know what? Let me take that back. Scratch that. Uh, they were truly best. They were blessed that the man of God was on the same ship with them and that God's favor and, uh, and protection, uh, protection accompanied Paul. Therefore, it spilled over them. Amen. And so what an awesome thing. And finally, the last thing that I wanted to share here is that many times, just like in the book of Acts uh, 27 verses 30 to 38, there's a lot of times, church, uh, I, and I entitled this portion, False Hope. And we see this in this entire account here, this entire story, and it speaks to us as well. There's many times uh, that we see these things and we put our hope in things instead of the Creator. And so Paul had declared to them that no one would perish, yet at the greatest height of the storm and, 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 and the fear of them being shipwrecked drove everyone aboard to abandon all hope. They, had, they were seen with these physical eyes and Paul was seen with spiritual eyes. And so he was telling them, hey, don't fear. We're not going to perish. Jesus said, not even a hair from your head is going to be lost. And so, but... When there's desperate times 
At times for us people, we feel that it calls for desperate measures. And so everyone in there begin to think about themselves and not about others. And so they resolve, hey, I'm going to save myself. I don't care about whoever else is here. And so th this kind of speaks to us too, that a lot of times knowing that there's dangers, uh, uh, we try to save ourselves even, uh, even when we create create more damage or we even put other people in danger we just think about ourselves and so so when they seen all these things happening they said we'll know what we'll do we'll get those lifeboats we'll jump in them and that us save us right but that was just false hope because of this great ship was falling apart what do you think would happen to those small lifeboats they would, they would be destroyed so Paul tells him immediately, hey, unless everyone stays on this ship, all, uh, lie, we will die, you know. So immediately, Scripture says they cut the ropes, they got rid of that false hope, and they stayed on that ship. And, and so when I think of this church, it reminds me of the story of Noah, where he could only find safety not in the things of the world, not on the land, not on the people, but the only safety that Noah had was for him to stay on the ark. Church, can you relate? Can you relate now? Can you see how this story is all developing for us that the only person that we can trust in is Jesus? And so God had appointed a means to an end. He had already told them, hey, if you do these things, you will not perish. And so they could only be saved by Christ and through him. But I feel that many times in my heart, church, we're, 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 we're all plagued with this disease of taking things into our hands. Hey, if they can't do it, I can do it. So God continues, church, all the time to provide this means to an end and to protection. Yet many times we trample underfoot all that he's done you know he gets us out we put ourselves back in he saves us and then we jump back in and we dig ourselves into a hole and he takes us out but the thing is church we have to realize that we can't save ourselves we can't save nobody only he can and so <clears throat> many times we try to do that and we try to find hope in things of the world which they're just temporary and they're false amen and so I, I just want to encourage you that your dependence would be on him because in the end, as I said earlier, he's the anchor of our soul. And it's only him that can save our souls. He's the only one that, 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 that we can have faith in. He's the only one that answers prayers. And he's the only one that we should obey. And so I want to encourage you with that. And, and uh, right here, church, we're, we're pretty much at the end of our sermon here. And, and I just wanted to run through this real quick. But in the, act, in the book of Acts 27, 39 through 44, I, I put the promise fulfilled. And so at the very end, church, if you read this account, you read where finally they're, 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 they're sailing along. They're being tossed to and fro. They've gotten rid of all these things. And the only thing left they had was to de depend on God. But what is so awesome is that when you see this portion, Jesus fulfills what he promises. The Lord fulfills to Paul that no one would perish and that everyone would live. And so uh, if you read the account of the word of God, uh, even though things seem hopeless, they seem that there was death, that they seem that destruction was inevitable, they found that only God Almighty could save them from this tremendous and, terrific, and horrific storm. And so what is so amazing about this, that when, when, we, when we look into the story, church, no one or nothing can hinder the plans of God. And so, church, this whole message, I pray that it's been an encouragement to you. I pray that this story it will be something that you will apply to your life. But one of my biggest things, I just want to encourage you to remain on the ark of Jesus Christ because he is the only one that will help you weather the storms of life. He remains and is the anchor of our soul. And, 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 and if, you, if he is not, church, the thing is you will be tossed to and fro, fro 
on, in, in the turbulent waves of life. Without him, we're nothing. And so I don't want you to be naive. I don't want you to be uh, misunderstand me or anything like that. But uh, the thing is, church, that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And so the awesome thing about this whole thing is that it's, it's, just, a, it's just a story to help affirm you, to help encourage you. That when you go through difficulties of life, only Jesus can help you. Amen. And so like Paul at that very time, uh, Scripture says that God told him that no one would perish. And, and Jesus tells us that same thing today in John 3, 16. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that who, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's the same thing. It applies right to this story. And this story applies right back to our lives. That Jesus is the only one that can help us from perishing in this life. This life that we've lived before him in depravity and the things of the world. And so I just want to encourage you with this, uh, this story, the word of God. Just that church, I know times are tough. And I, I remember moments in my life that that I wanted to give up. You know, when God first called me to to the ministry, there was a point that that things got tough. You know, and there was many moments that that uh, I was alone in these things. But the awesome thing is that Jesus kept through the Holy Spirit, kept encouraging me not to give up. And there was moments I wanted to. There was moments that I, I wanted to throw my hands up and say, God, uh, serving you is this? Then I don't want it. But the awesome thing, he was patient with me. He loved me. He allowed me to go through these things. He grew me. And you know what I learned is that God is faithful. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is the one that keeps us grounded. He's the anchor of our soul. And through him, you can overcome. And so as long as you continue to trust in Jesus, uh, you'll make it. I mean, here I am. I can testify to just countless stories of God just helping me through the rigors and the storms of life. Amen. And so with that said, I just want to uh, say thank you for tuning in. And I pray it's a blessing to you. And I uh, just want to encourage you. Do you have any questions uh, uh, about this, this story, about scripture, about a relationship with Jesus? We'd love for you to reach out. You can reach out at 806-298-2581. And we'd just like to share with you a little more about our Savior Jesus and how he can be the anchor of your soul. Amen. With that said, God bless you. You guys have a great week.